Welcome to today's episode of the Normalized Surrogacy Podcast by Surrogacy Mentor. I'm your host, Carrie Flamer Powell, experienced gestational surrogate, surrogacy agency founder, and owner of Surrogacy Mentor, and now also Modern Parent Mentor, where our aim is a safe, ethical, and enjoyable surrogacy journey for all. Today, I'm excited to have licensed marriage and family therapist, Andrea Bryman, with us today. Welcome, Andrea. Hi, Carrie. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so glad we're finally able to do an episode together. We've been working together in the industry for years, and finally we get to talk on the podcast. So thank you. So today we are talking about surrogates and loss and how the mental health profession addresses that in the surrogacy industry. So before we dive into this really important topic, um, I do want to give a little bio on Andrea. So as the founder and CEO of Bryman Counseling Associates, Andrea Bryman has more than 25 years of clinical experience working in the field of assisted reproduction. Andrea's focus on assisted reproduction stemmed from her own personal experience with infertility. She received her master's in marriage, family, and child counseling from the University of Southern California. Andrea has continued her professional growth in the field of infertility through research and involvement as a professional member of the American Society for Reproductive Medicine. She serves currently as the mental health chair for the Society for Ethics and Egg Donation and Surrogacy. And she's also served on the European Society of Human Reproduction and Embryology, Resolve, and the American Bar Association. So you've become an institution in the industry and well known for all the great work that you do. So that's wonderful. Well, that's a new title, an institution. Well, I thank you, Institution. <laughs> yes. An icon, a legend. What should we say? Yeah, I don't know. I'm going to pass that on to my family and see how they respond to me being an institution. <laughs> <laughs> Instant respect it. in my household. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Well, so glad to have you with us today. Like I said, for this really important topic. And it's one that I don't think is discussed quite enough, honestly, um, which is surrogates who experience a loss, meaning a loss of a pregnancy um, during their surrogacy journey. So why don't we just start off just sort of basic, maybe for people who don't know much about surrogacy or are just starting to investigate surrogacy, either as surrogates, particularly as potential surrogates, but also maybe just um, as parents or just in general, trying to understand surrogacy. What are some examples in your experience where scenarios where a surrogate would face a loss of a pregnancy? And then to expand on that, what is different about that or not different about that than a loss of your own child? So if we're talking about examples of, of, of losses, I mean, it starts at, at the most first level, I think would be is if there's a failed transfer mm -hmm. where that's a loss in itself is that when the trans, there's a transfer and there's no pregnancy, that's one level of loss. And then we go on to there is a pregnancy and it doesn't progress. There's a natural loss um, of a miscarriage, whether whatever the reasons are. Mm -hmm. um, then sometimes there's um, a chromosomal abnormality or there's a reason to terminate a pregnancy um, mm -hmm. for health reasons. Um, so whether that's through selective reduction or termination, that's a loss. And then it goes all the way to the end of the spectrum is, you know, giving birth to a stillborn. Mm -hmm. So the, the things that you mentioned in the beginning, I think are important. So for people that may not know what a transfer is, so we're talking about an embryo transfer where the embryo is transferred into the uterus of a gestational surrogate. And we're talking about a failed transfer is what we called it, meaning the embryo just did not take, did not implant, and did not become a viable pregnancy. Um, and then you also mentioned maybe the pregnancy did, there was a, an actual chemical pregnancy or even an ultrasound confirmed pregnancy, but for some reason it did not continue. It did not develop into a viable continuing pregnancy. So let's talk about that because I, as a surrogate, experienced a failed transfer, and I can say from experience that it's 
it's really hard. It's like you blame yourself, even though there's nothing different you could have done, assuming the surrogate took all the medications she was supposed to at the time she was supposed to. You just, you can't help but question your body, right? So talk about that from a mental health perspective. You know, one of the things that we talk about with carriers is often is that women opt to become carriers because they do pregnancy well. It's been easy for them. They've had good pregnancies. So one of the things we need to remember is that you're not conceiving naturally. This is a new experience for your body. And Mm -hmm. you might be experiencing things a little bit differently. Um, You don't. So when you put a foreign entity into your body, you don't, even if you follow all the rules, it doesn't always work. And that's a completely different experience for so many carriers. They don't understand this. And there's the sense of like, I I, I really, really want to do this. I don't know why it's not working because it's always worked in the past. Mm -hmm. Um, So that feeling of a failed transfer or miscarry is like, it's such a brand new experience for a carrier that um, I've seen them res- over the years, I've seen people respond very differently to this. Mm-hmm. Um, some of it's the first time they've ever experienced a loss. So there's this grieving, um, mm-hmm. but there's also the sense of urgency to want to succeed. And can we do another transfer quickly? Because mm-hmm. I know I can do this. Like, yeah. I don't know what went wrong. I know I can do this. And the sense of like having to prove themselves, Mm -hmm. So I think that those are things that we often have to address um, Mm -hmm. with carriers. And sometimes we have to explain to them. And and I think that, you know, as our conversation goes on, we, you know, we'll probably talk about this a little bit more, but really is the intended parents that they're working have already often experienced a series of losses already Mm -hmm. that this is something so new to them and, and they're, often can see through the eyes of their intended parents and often makes them a little bit more empathetic and compassionate towards the intended parents that they're working with. Yeah, absolutely. And such a good point because I hear so often as formerly as a surrogacy agency owner and now doing what I do now with surrogacy mentor, I hear so many times from potential surrogates Um, I am so good at getting pregnant. I get pregnant so easily. It's always been easy for me to get pregnant and they don't quite understand yet because they haven't had the education about surrogacy that we're not doing this the way you've done it before. Right, exactly. It's the IVF this time and IVF is very different and may or may not work the first time. And it's, yeah, it's a completely different experience. And then the other piece of what you mentioned is also very true, which is about the this feeling as a surrogate after you have a failed transfer of when can we try again? Because by the time a surrogate gets to transfer, she's well into a minimum of six months, usually many more than that in the process where she's been going through screening and matching and legal and medication cycle. And now we're finally at this, you know, first finish line, which is getting to the embryo transfer and it didn't work. Like this is like almost a year of your life in most cases that you've invested in this as a surrogate and you want this so badly that there is certainly a sense of failure. And also, can we please just try again? And this is what we were talking about in our last episode of our podcast, which is that surrogacy is such a hurry up and wait. There's so much like once you finally see a light at the end of a tunnel, there's a potential that you're going to have to wait again for something. And in the case of a failed transfer, most clinics like to see a minimum of one month or one menstrual cycle in between. So you're looking at a minimum one month, typically longer wait. So there's definitely a need for helping surrogates process that. Well, there's also, I think there's also this sense, this need to up to that point is like, everybody's so positive and the energy is so high. And, mm-hmm. and there's a sense of like, we always ask surrogates, why do you want to be a surrogate? Not, you know, cause I've had easy pregnancies, but I really, really, really want to help a family. So there's this, what I call this like savior feature, mm-hmm. like factor where mm-hmm. I'm going to like, I'm going to just make a family whole and I'm going to be the one that does this mm-hmm. on the flip side. It instantly becomes like, I'm the one that's not letting them do this. 
right and this and this weight that they carry this responsibility that they carry on their shoulders even though we all know logically and intellectually that we don't have control over these things but emotionally we carry this you know carriers carry this responsibility and this this weight on their shoulders of being the savior like i'm going to be the one to give this to make this family whole to give them something that they've wanted so badly and now i can't or now i didn't and now i now i'm the reason for more grief for them right yeah and that's beyond the loss yeah. Of, of dealing with a, you know, not a, of a, of a miscarriage or a termination or whatever, the, or, or no pregnancy. It's this sense of letting someone down Yeah, and, and reevaluating your role in the process. Yeah. I was going to be exactly, I was going to be part of making it all better. And now I'm part of the grief and the, and the yeah, waiting absolutely. and the continuing of the story of pain. <laughs> And it's not necessarily that dramatic, but it can feel that dramatic when you're going through it. Absolutely. But I, but I can say on a, on a, on a different note that sometimes these moments I've seen incredible relationships formed and bonding that goes through um, with everybody. There's this growth that, that personal growth that comes out of this and, and, and such a bond that comes between whether, whether the intended parents, the carrier decide to move forward or not, but to go through the experience together Mm -hmm. and being part of that, I guess that human experience that's so genuine and so raw to Mm -hmm. go through that together. Definitely. It's funny you mentioned that I was just going through my Facebook memories today and it was 10 years ago this week that I was going through my first medication cycle for my first transfer. And I remember very clearly that was the last of their embryos. They were, they were going to have to make more embryos if it didn't work and it didn't work. That transfer did not work. And I remember one of my intended mothers saying, we're going to make this work or we're going to run out of blood trying. I remember her saying that exact line and I was like, okay, we are in this. And it just solidified that bond. Like, and we had a six month break between that transfer and the next transfer. So it solidified and held me through that six month break of like, we are in this together. Right. Right. So let's talk about, um, sort of that next, uh, level, I guess, if you will, Um, that you mentioned, which is, let's say a pregnancy does take, and there is a viable pregnancy. And at some point there's a loss and we know there's a million reasons why that could happen. It could be, as you mentioned, chromosomal, it could be just a natural developmental issue. Um, It could be lots of things. So let's talk about a loss during a pregnancy and how that um, affects the surrogate And what sort of mental health resources are available for surrogates when something like that happens? So, and I'll defer back to you because I, I, I I view you as the expert at having been a surrogate. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I think the loss is, is, is real. I mean, so Mm -hmm. many surrogates that we talk to in, in the, in their journeys when this happens is, is feeling not entitled to feel the loss. Mm-hmm. I shouldn't, you know, why it's not my, it's not my baby. It was just my body. And I feel so bad for the intended parents, mm-hmm. but they need to be given permission to mm-hmm. grieve. It's still, it's a loss and their body's gone through the loss. There's hormones involved. It's, it's, fetus they it was a lost as whether whether you're the intended parent or you're the carrier you're experiencing a loss and you have to give you have to allow yourself to grieve absolutely and not feel that you're not entitled to grieve because it wasn't your baby and I feel like we hit we hit that moment so often with carriers like oh well you know I I I, you know it's a it's the intended parent's place to grieve it's not my place to grieve And you're, you know, we lose, we lose sight that carriers are human beings. Well, I never lose sight of it, but I think in their minds, sometimes that they don't feel entitled to be able to feel sad because it wasn't their baby. Um, What services are in place? Well, we're here, you know, private counseling. I mean, 
I've always been here. We're here to provide mm-hmm. provide support. Um, I think that this kind of falls back into, I mean, this might be controversial to say, but I think I want to throw it back onto agencies and, and other affiliated uh, providers to make that referral mm-hmm. and falling into that category of, of feeling like it's not your place to grieve. Mm-hmm. And I think it, the onus has to go on to all these other allied professionals to allow carriers to grieve. Mm-hmm. Just as as if it was postpartum depression or any other kind of loss, they need to be given resources to talk to someone and be able to grieve. Yeah, definitely. The pain of the loss is usually overshadowed by the guilt. And as you mentioned, it's it's hard to step into that and really process the the pain of, okay, I'm going through a loss because you feel so guilty and you feel so upset that you're letting them down. and. Right. Uh, there's all different degrees of this, right? I feel like my, I don't feel like you can compare loss, but I feel like mine in comparison is, is mild. Um, we had a 10 week loss of a twin. And so we, I just happened to be on vacation and I had permission to go on vacation from the parents. And I saw the tiny, tiniest bit of, of spotting. I mean, like something you would not even notice really ever or make a big deal about ever. And I was like, you know what? not my baby. I was pregnant with twins. It's not my pregnancy. I better go get this checked out. Went to the ER, could not find a second heartbeat. There had been a second heartbeat for 10 weeks and now there was nothing. They're like, we don't see a heartbeat. We don't see another fetus. We don't see another sac. Like it's, Mm -hmm. there's nothing in there except one baby. Mm -hmm. And so it had just some, at some point stopped and reabsorbed and just Mm -hmm. completely I guess it's called a vanishing twin. And so it was really hard conversation to have with the parents, but it was also like, I was letting their, letting them down. Right. I was felt so guilty. And maybe if I hadn't gone on vacation, maybe if I had stayed home, this wouldn't have happened. Right. So I think that it's important that surrogates have someone to talk to at that point. And I was independent. So I did not have anyone to talk to. Um, it wasn't something that we'd written into our contract. And that's a question I wanted to ask you is, do you see agencies and intended or independent matches writing into their contracts, ongoing support during the journey? Is that becoming more common? We have some agencies that want us to talk to their carriers on a monthly basis. And then we also have uh, people that just say, you know, we have a carrier that needs a session. Can you accommodate them? which we do. Um, Yeah. Is it helpful to be in the contract? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think if anything, it just gives um, peace of mind to Mm -hmm. to all parties, whether it's the intended parents or the carrier, that that there's there's help there if it's needed. Mm -hmm. There's a resource there. I think it was interesting what you just said. when you were talking about your experience mm-hmm. and you said, well, mine was mild. Yeah. Was mild. Like, like you qualified it. Yeah. I think that's just it. It's like, I think we need to move away from qualifying. Like you weren't entitled to feel that way because it was a mild one. Yeah. Yeah. There's no, there's no mild loss. A loss is a loss. And mm-hmm. um, I think that's kind of what we were just talking about is allowing yourself to feel, feel a loss. hmm Yeah. It's funny, right? Even 10 years later and all these, you know, hundreds of cases that I've managed for other people, I still. Yeah. Like you aren't entitled to feel it. It was a mild loss. What what is a mild loss? The loss is a loss. It's like a near miss when people say it's a near miss. Well, it was a miss. It wasn't a near miss. It was a miss. (laughs) Right. Yeah. You know, it's, you're right. It's, it's definitely something that surrogates. There's just a mentality that you have to work against, which is like you're here to make things better. And it's and I think as an industry, it. there's this expectation that that carriers detach from the experience. Mm-hmm. Detach. And how do you just turn off in your mind, your emotions mm-hmm. and your feelings? Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah. you understand what you're doing and what your purpose is and why you're doing it. But it doesn't mean that you don't have feelings or emotions. Sure. Absolutely. I agree. 
And I'm a huge advocate for mental health throughout the journey. As an agency owner, I always requested that the intended parents, the attorneys, when they were drafting contracts, that they put in an allowance that could be used at any time for any reason by the surrogate to access mental health support. And it was just a dollar amount that was set aside and she could use it or not, but it was up to her when and how to use that mental health support. And I feel like that's that should be industry standard, whether you are, are with an agency or with um, an independent match, that there should be a mental health. I agree allocation. with you 100%. I agree yeah. with you 100%. Because you just never know when you're going to need it. And so let's talk about um, loss as it pertains to, you know, we've talked up, up to this point about losses that are out of this, out of anyone's control. But what about the situation where you come to a really difficult decision that has to be made by the intended parents and or the surrogate about when to end a pregnancy due to quality of life issue for the surrogate and or the child? Um, are there, do you think, are there enough mental health supports in place for that? And I'm guessing that's typically more than one session for a surrogate when let's say she has a 20 a week termination because there's no quality of life for the baby, that there's been a diagnosed condition or perhaps sometimes her life's get, in danger. Sometimes we get calls for this. And sometimes I would always expect that we would have more referrals for this area mm -hmm. and we don't. Mm -hmm. This is a this is an area that we spend a lot of time in our evaluations mm -hmm. before transfer, before legal theoretically, is mm -hmm. making sure everybody's on the same page. It's yes. it's and I think legal does it, but we like to talk about it from an emotional perspective as well. And and what does this mean and and how you know how will you manage this if you know many people are very very, I guess when it's not happening, it's really easy to, to detach and say, yes, okay. Um, the challenging cases are when I get, uh, I haven't, hasn't happened in a long time, but I used to get calls the day before. And in cases, especially when I wasn't even involved, all of a sudden I get an emergency phone call. We have a carrier who's um, supposed to go in to have a, have a reduction tomorrow or termination tomorrow, and she's changed her mind. Will you have a session with her and tell her that she needs to go have this done? Oh, geez. Oh, yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to do that right now. Um, <laughs> I'm going to tell her. <laughs> so then it's just as, I'm like, well, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to tell anybody to talk about it, but I will be there for her to talk to. And I will be a sounding board for her and her family for whatever they want to talk about. Um, mm -hmm. Again, you can have everything in place, but the bottom line is everybody needs to understand that it's her body and she still has a legal right to make her own choices for her own body. Mm -hmm. And she could be in breach of her contract and have to deal with all the things that go along with being in a breach of contract, but it's still her body. Right. I'm going to be the last person to tell somebody what they, what they can and can't do with their body. Yeah. Um, of course. And it's hard. And does that happen very often? No. I mean, that's why it's so, so important to have these conversations up front and, and talk about things along the way. And yes, mm -hmm. it is, it's, sometimes it's easier, sometimes it's hard because it's not very easier, but at least logically we can wrap our brain around why we're doing it, why, mm -hmm. why it's happening. And we've already had this plan in place if it were to happen. Mm -hmm. And we know logically why, why, why it's happening versus a loss that has no explanation or, or reason of why it happened. Right. Uh, yeah. It, I think that, um, as you mentioned, these, it, these, um, situations with termination where a decision has to be made during the pregnancy to, to reduce a pregnancy down from multiples or to terminate a pregnancy. Thankfully, they're very rare, but mm -hmm. they're not so rare that we shouldn't be talking about them in the realm of more mental health support and making sure that there are safeguards in the contracts that should something like this come up, that everyone has mental health support, um, but particularly the surrogate in this situation. Um, I think that it's really important. I don't think it's happening enough. That yeah, I agree. Not. You know, I think as we're talking about, I feel like it's always viewed as a medical procedure mm -hmm. rather than 
you know, we got to take care of the medical aspect of taking care of this, but there's not that component of how are we going to take care of everybody emotionally in this process. Right. And I think those two need to go hand in hand in the minds of agencies, attorneys, independent uh, IPs who are managing their own. You need to think about with every medical procedure, with every medical decision, there's almost always going to be an emotional component, a mental health component for a pregnant woman or a woman trying to get pregnant, right? And so what support would someone in that situation need and how do we build that in from the beginning? I think it's super important. And yeah, I think that hopefully having conversations like this brings to light for women considering becoming a surrogate that they could encounter a situation like this. So then they're advocating for themselves and asking for these things. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. We we spend a lot of time talking to carriers about advocating for themselves. You know, if we ask, I know when I was doing evaluations and I'd ask a question and if it was like, one of the common things is like, how do you feel about having amniocentesis? And I could always tell by their expression was like, they'll be like, yeah, I guess I'm okay. Well, you can tell by something. I'm like, do you know what I'm, what I'm even asking? Yeah. And they're like, I I think, I don't know. And Mm -hmm. then I have to get on my soapbox. It's like you, if you don't understand what something is, you need to ask because Mm -hmm. really there's a lot of people involved in this and everybody has good intentions, but really the only person that's going to be looking out for you is you. Mm -hmm. And there is no silly questions and don't answer yes to anything that you don't understand what Mm -hmm. it is. And if you don't understand it, you need to ask, what is that? And if you feel like you need support through that, you need to ask for it. You need to advocate for it. Mm -hmm. If you have done, you look at that contract that is not set in stone. You can, you can modify it. You can ask questions. You can ask for additional things. If you feel like you want mental health support, put it in there. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I think that as someone who went through an independent journey 10 years ago versus someone now on the other side of 10 years, having worked as the surrogacy agency owner and helping hundreds and hundreds of people go through surrogacy, there are many things I would ask for now as a surrogate that I wouldn't have even known to ask for then. So education is key, whether you're independent or with an agency, knowing what could happen what you need to support yourself during those things, if they do happen, just education and getting the right information up front so that you have all the, all the facts and all the information. And then you, they always say, you know, hope for the best, expect the worst. That's sort of what we're doing here is trying to build a network, a support network underneath you in case the worst happens. Yeah. But you know, I think the hard part is that so many people don't know what to educate themselves about. Mm -hmm. You know, mm-hmm. you, you know so much more now because you've been working in the industry and you've been mm-hmm. doing this for so long. But if you think of, of someone that's become a carrier and they see their contract, they don't, they don't know. I mean, there's so many times we talk about if you need to go on bed rest, who's going to help you? But, and they're like, oh, my husband. Okay, well, what happens when he has to go to work? Mm-hmm. Oh, my kids will help me. Oh, your five-year-old's going to be able to go cook a meal for her, him or herself. Yeah. I mean, the laundry. And, le- and let's talk about like, like, what happens if you go into preterm labor and you have to be in the hospital for, for two months, who's going to help? So I would always, I'm like, educate yourself, you know, make some phone calls because when you get a contract, there'll be a number in there and how much you're going to be reimbursed. Do, do your education, find out how much is it to have someone on an hourly basis, on a daily basis, on a weekly, what happens if you need someone to come stay at your house for an extended period of time? I said, at least when you go in, you're coming in educated and you understand. And so, and I use, always use that as an example with anything. So there's something, at least if you're looking at a figure, you know, whether or not it's a reasonable amount Mm -hmm. to, and you can always say, you know, I'm not trying to be greedy or anything about this. I've just done my research and these are what's going to cost me. I said, because I don't want you to be out of pocket for something. I'm like, you're, again, we want everybody feeling good about helping somebody. So. Absolutely. Okay, that was like a little side thing. I probably they yeah, inside. I think that, that's <laughs> I think it's super important and it actually leads me to my next question, which is how can surrogate surrogacy agencies or other surrogacy professionals best support surrogates 
around loss and around how to prepare and advocate for themselves when it comes to loss. As someone who has supported surrogates from failed transfers all the way to a full-term baby who was born and died moments later, um, there is a line that is really difficult for surrogacy professionals to know if they're crossing when they're trying to be there and be supportive and offer themselves to, to support the surrogate through this. And then knowing when you need to step away and let a mental health professional step in and what is that line so that you're not just like completely detaching as a professional and saying, let the mental health services, you know, deal with it, but also not stepping over that line and trying to provide mental health services yourself as an agency owner or professional. I think that I, I absolutely think that's that that is a hard line for so many non-mental health providers is, is, you know, just human nature to want to be supportive and empathetic. And, and I guess my advice to you is like, when do you know not to give medical advice? When do you know not to, not to be giving legal advice? Mm -hmm. I mean, our human nature is to, I mean, so much of mental health is talking Mm -hmm. and support. Mm -hmm. And that's, we do that in our everyday lives and we do it with our family members. We do it with our friends. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's, it's so many people in our industry are, are nurturing people because we get drawn to this field because we want to help people build their families. I agree with that. And I think the second half of that, that maybe doesn't happen as often is that the, the professionals, in my opinion, and you tell me what you think, should be staying in communication with that mental health provider and saying, okay, what do we need more sessions? Does she, do she need follow-up? What should we be doing on our end? And and almost getting mental health counseling on their own behalf, which I got grief counseling for myself and my staff after our surrogate that had a full-term loss, because it was really hard on us. And we wanted to know how do we support this? How do we support these parents and surrogate, first -hmm. of all, and then how do we get through this trauma ourselves? Because we are traumatized. That was amazing that you were able to even be, have that awareness of wanting to help everybody. So that's. Yeah. I think there needs to be more collaboration in my opinion with professionals and mental health, not collaboration that, that it doesn't exist now, but I think an ongoing relationship of. Of course. New collaboration, right? So we, so we need to break, break down the barriers of the stigma of mental health, that it can be a positive thing and not only bring it in when there's something negative going on. And, mm-hmm. and, you know, one of the challenges that we, that we always face is, you know, and I, and as I built my team of therapists is always like, you need to remember that people, when they sign up to become a carrier, they're not signing up for mental health. They're signing yeah. up to help someone have a baby. So then they, they near they have to have a psychological evaluation. They're like, ah, I don't want to do that. Or like, what's that involved? And yeah, like, hey, well, let's, let's, let's educate them about why it's important to have this conversation. And, and just because, you know, your intentions might be wonderful. It just might not be the right thing for you to be doing. And I think mm-hmm. that falls across the whole board of the whole journey is, is, is normalizing the importance of mental health providers um, and having them be part of a team rather than the fallback fix it. And I think that's my experience over the years is when I tend to get involved is when then something needs fixing Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. so many things could be avoided the fixing part Mm because we're not fixers. Mm -hmm. If we had been part of a team along the way, maybe some scenarios might not have happened. Sometimes communication breaks down. Sometimes life stressors happen. Mm -hmm. And if there was a mental health provider involved along the way, it would just been part of the journey and they would have just had someone to turn to Mm -hmm. before things escalated. Definitely being proactive instead of reactive. You know, and, and if you have, if you have a clinician available, if something comes up at a clinic at a doctor's appointment and they someone just needs to process it, whether it means going on bed rest or or a medical condition or just they need to if you start at the very beginning rather than 
oh, here you've just experienced a loss. You know, oh, here you can talk. You have, we'll give you one or two sessions and you can talk this through with a therapist. And, mm -hmm. you know, we, we don't wave our magic wands, you know. Right. Yeah. You're not, you're not magicians. I get that. And I, I've always said, even for like uh, relationships, you know, romantic relationships, like having therapy as just a, a maintenance thing throughout a relationship, I think is so much better than going when things are completely broken and trying to fix them. And I think the same logic applies to surrogacy. Yeah, having, preemptive, preemptive yeah, counseling. Yeah. yeah. Having it be part of the process. And I think that it, it, absolutely is necessary and helpful during loss as we're talking about today and that the, of the last piece of loss that we don't think about as loss but there is a piece of it that feels like loss is the end of a journey um and absolutely even absolutely. if everything goes perfect right even if there's no physical loss of a pregnancy or nothing perfect pregnancy perfect relationship with the parents there is still an end to a journey that has been monumentally life-changing for everyone involved. Absolutely. Absolutely. And there needs to be some sort of mental health support, in my opinion, around that change in the journey. Oh, I, I agree a hundred percent. You know, I've talked to so many carriers after delivery and, you know, society says, oh, how did they separate from the baby? They met so hard being, and, and really what I hear from carriers is, I, it's, it was never the issue of separating from the baby because I knew going in, it wasn't my baby. It was, I miss that relationship with my yes. intended parents because it's so intimate. It's so intense. Yes. And leading up to the birth, which is like the, the climax of the whole experience. Mm -hmm. And then it's over. And yes, carriers are going to go back to their 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 lives pre, pre surrogacy. And, the, and so many are ready for that. And the joy of not having to get up all night with the baby and all of that. But that that human experience that they had with the family is not there anymore. And, right. and that, and I think that's what drives a lot of carriers to become a carrier again, because, yeah. you know, the adrenaline that goes in with all of that. And, yeah. and if you, if you really think about it, it's like the women that are becoming carriers are, are young women with small, you know, often with small children, mm -hmm. being a carrier gives you your own, a separate identity, your own a separate existence from being a mother, mm -hmm. being a wife, mm -hmm. which seems to surround young women's lives at that time when they become carriers, mm -hmm. it gives you your own, your own place. And it's a place, yeah. and it's at a time in their lives where there's, they're such caregivers and they're, and they're taking care of their family. They're taking care of their children. Mm -hmm. Everything is about taking care of others. And when you're in this surrogacy journey, there's that moment where someone's taking, you have these intended parents that are and agencies, uh, case managers. There's people that are taking care of you. Right. And that doesn't happen for many people at that stage of their lives. Right. Where, you know, where they're taking care of their parents. So here's someone that's just, how are you? How are you feeling? You know, most yeah. of these young women, nobody's asked them in months or years. Yeah. How are you feeling? And yeah. there's people that are like, I want to send you flowers. Can I get you a massage? Like, right. it's so wonderful. And it's like, and yeah. then that's over. Right. And that whole experience. And then there's, there is that loss. There mm -hmm. is that loss of that special mm -hmm. moment, that, yeah. that journey. Absolutely. It's and it's very real. real. It's very yeah. real. We just talked about it on our last podcast episode of, it, it, it's very much like the women who plan this dream epic wedding for years and they have this amazing wedding and then it's over and they have like post-wedding depression. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so Absolutely. The huge event is over. It's very similar to that feeling of like, oh, well now they have a baby to take care of and I have a life to get back to. And our every day is not consumed with this process anymore. Mm -hmm. And now what do I do with myself? I have to refine myself in a lot of ways. It's right. hard. Right. So I think mental health is invaluable during that time. So, well, what is a parting thought that you would give to women listening to this podcast today that are considering becoming surrogates um, as it pertains to loss and mental health and what they should be thinking about? You know, one of the things that I was thinking about when I was getting ready to talk with you about this is and something I think that's really important that I try to explain to intended parents and to carriers when we have often we'll do joint sessions together and. I want to really reiterate to them that when there's a loss, that 
all parties might be experiencing it a little bit differently Mm -hmm. and to keep their minds open and not make assumptions. You know, I, it's like we talked about earlier is that carriers become carriers, not because they want to have another baby, but you know, because they've done pregnancy well and it's come easy and they want to help another family have a baby. Um, so when there's this loss, there's that sense of urgency to want to try again. And then you have intended parents on the other side who have had sometimes a series of losses reaching to get to this point, Mm -hmm. um, whether it's just the loss of their fertility, a loss of, you know, prior pregnancies, there's just often been a lot of, a lot of losses. So there's this sometimes, you know, when, when a carrier loses, has a loss, wants to try again, sometimes intended parents need this time to regroup and process, and they might need more time. So I tell, or it might be vice versa. It might be the first time that a carrier has experienced a loss and needs time to process an intended parent is just like, it's got the eye on the prize and it's just like, let's go. And, you know, let's, I want to keep trying. It doesn't matter how, how, you know, what we need to do and we're in this together and let's just keep going. Um, so if you guys aren't on the same page at the same time, just know that you just might be experiencing things a little bit differently, you know? So if you're texting your intended parents, you know, and they're not, and you know, what you feel like you're on texting them and they're not replying, it's not because they hate you and think that you're a terrible person and blame you. It might just be that they're processing things. And on the intended parent side, I tell them, you know, if it feels like they're texting, she's the, that your carrier is being insensitive to you and, and why won't she just let you be? It's not because she's insensitive. It's because she really cares and really, really wants to help you. Yeah. And the same thing. So I really try and tell everybody that everybody might be experiencing things a little bit differently. It might not be on the same page and it kind of overflows to the whole journey is not to make assumptions and, and everybody's journey while you're going it through together might be different. Yeah, that's so true. So true. And I think it's a good lesson for people to to think about is that you are inviting a whole new relationship, a whole new relationship that you've never experienced ever before in your life. And that most people won't ever get to experience. Exactly. And you know how unique it's such a unique relationship and, Completely. and you go from, from not knowing to each other to being intimate, like overnight. Yeah. Completely. Like doing one of the most intimate things you can do in life with someone you've never met before that might even live in a different part of the world. (laughs) It's a lot. So yeah, I think that um, to wrap it all up with a little bow is that mental health support should be an integral part of every surrogacy journey, not just when we're experiencing pain and loss, um, but that it's certainly necessary during those times um, and can be much more effective and much more powerful if it's part of an integral Um, piece of a journey. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, I have just so enjoyed this conversation and I hope it's been helpful for our listeners and just want to thank you so much for taking the time to to do this with us today. Thank you for letting me be part of this conversation. It's so important. And, you know, I love talking to you, Carrie. So thank you. We're here, whatever you need us. I'm happy to help in any way we can. So appreciate you. Thanks, Andrea. And that brings us to the end of this episode of the Normalized Surrogacy Podcast by Surrogacy Mentor. Again, I'm your host, Carrie Flamer-Powell, and again, want to thank our very special guest, Andrea Bryman, for joining us today. Be sure to check us out online at surrogacymentor.com and modernparentmentor.com, where you can take our easy two-minute surrogacy quizzes on those websites for an agency or independent surrogacy journey. Don't forget to subscribe to this podcast to learn more about gestational surrogacy and how to have a safe, ethical, and enjoyable journey. Talk to you next time.